Josephine, pleasure having you on the series this morning. To begin, the budget was just handed down on Tuesday evening. To what extent do you anticipate large-scale infrastructure spending will spur on the development of new projects? I don't know. Um, I, we've listened to a lot of announcements from government, but I'm not entirely sure what actually ends up um, shovel ready and, and started. That said though there does seem to be a genuine commitment from government to want to continue to stimulate the economy so I feel quite positive that we should see a good trickle down effect to construction companies like ours here at Build Corp uh, but uh, let's just wait and see. Business conditions have reached near record highs with both sentiment and investment continuing to drive demand. How would you evaluate your workbook? We're not bad actually. We fared pretty well through COVID because construction was deemed an essential service as you would know. Uh, our forward workload is fine but conditions are a little bit variable. So cost of steel has gone through the roof, supply of timber, cost of containers. Um, so there is some, still some uncertainty moving forward around supply chain risk more um, than anything else. Companies like ours seem to be okay. There is always in these downtimes a, a flight to quality and just surety and we've been around a long time and, and we find that in times like these clients will tend to, you know, select a build corp type builder um, over others and pick us from second and third spot just because we're able to you know, give them confidence we'll still be around. Um, so I think we're okay but more broadly there's a bit more pain to come I think. That was my next question. Have you seen substantive increases to either the cost of materials, which you sort of answered there, or in terms of being able to get adequate staffing resources? So trades is where we're seeing the issue. Um, a lot of craftsmen and tradespeople, of course, come from overseas, but we're seeing that across every sector, hospitality, uh, you know, wherever we go. I think this business of the impact of uh, no immigration for a little while longer is, is going to create some pinch points absolutely but government is trying to stimulate that with um, you know appre apprenticeships etc and, and requiring organisations to begin to consider apprenticeships a bit more heavily and, and leaning into that with funding. Which sectors are proving the busiest for Bill Corp currently? A lot less fit out commercial fit out work but a lot more refurbishment of, of assets so asset owners are wanting to upgrade uh, their assets while they're there. Organisations are taking the opportunity to do, to do broader uplift work around ACP etc um, while we're here. Our joinery business, we own a joinery shop Euroline, that's particularly busy at the moment. I think they do provide supply chain security being produced here in Australia has been terrific so that's been very busy. While it was a little slow at the very beginning around you know March, April we had projects that were going some did stop in their tracks even though we were on site where asset owners were concerned and wanting more um, tenants committed to uh, projects before we continue so that was a little bit strange but that's picked up again now so that's a relief. Do you anticipate a long-term impact of this work from home trend? I have quite a, uh, a firm view that COVID shouldn't have been the reason to look at flexible work. Some roles can be done flexibly and some can't and COVID shouldn't have been the reason for that. The role is the role. So for example, a frontline worker here at Build Corp, a site supervisor, needs to open the site. That can't be done from home. But there may be roles like accounts payable, accounts receivable, that could theoretically be done from anywhere really. So some roles lend themselves to flexibility more than others and COVID or no COVID, that shouldn't have been the driver for it. All that COVID did, I think, was for some organisations where flexibility wasn't an option in any role, it made them think, well, maybe we can consider flexibility in some roles, but it shouldn't be have been the, um, the reason and the main driver. I think for our sectors, though, in the office sector more broadly, we probably will see that there are um, there may be some reduced opportunities for some um, asset owners to you know, continue on with, with tenants in the same structures and leasing formats that they had. Some may want less space. Interestingly, we've taken more here at Build Corp. We, we've picked up another half a floor. For companies that are going well, I think that they will need more. But for a business like ours at Build Corp, where culture is at the heart of everything we do, we need people here. And we had a pretty rapid return to work, um, as in return to the office, for those uh, roles that were there. And it it does a number of things for us. When we've got young people in the organisation who need to be in the boardroom or need to be sitting along on site, sitting alongside their project manager as they're negotiating contracts, those, those um, that halo effect of just being around the serendipitous opportunities that happen, the water cooler moments that we talk about, 
are not going to happen from you know, your lounge room or bedroom or kitchen table. So for us, where we have such a focus on building the pipeline of people, we've got really long tenure. Most of our general managers have been with us for at least 15 years or more, and they've been taught on, on, you know, on the job. So for us personally as a business, it's something that keeps our culture strong um, to get and uh, together. Some other organisations are saying that flexibility works for them and that they can hold cultures um, healthy and well um, working remotely. I think Atlassian said they're not going to require anybody to necessarily return to work. But for a business like ours, we're a people business, we're a service provider. We're sort of one team, you know, one, one in all in. And because we've got a site staff who have to turn up to work regardless of where they are, there's certainly been a feeling here in the office based roles where they said, well, we're one build corp, we're all in. So if they're on the job at work, we're in there with them and we're grateful. Over the past 10 years in particular, there's been a major focus on finding new, more efficient building materials to work with, as well as introducing building-wide sustainability practices. How significant is this theme in terms of the way buildings are constructed and operated today? So how they're constructed, so there's two questions there, it's significant and how they're constructed doesn't really make that much of a difference for us. We, uh, we build to drawings. Uh, there is an opportunity for us when we engage with, in an early contract engagement format in ECI, we call it for us to feed into that with our subcontractors to talk about efficiencies, not just in new materials and more sustainable materials, but better ways to build things that actually add value to designs without impairing the design intent. So working really closely with the architects who drive these things and ensuring that nothing changes for the architect and their design intent, but just giving them a secondary option to put on the table to say say, here's what it will cost to build with that material, but if you would consider this one as well, um, and you think that's not too different to what you've got, there's a, a $5 million saving in there for the client, for example. So that's the building part of it. Uh, for the asset owners, I think more and more tenants are wanting to be in buildings where they feel good about being there, where they've you know, got good neighbours ratings, where um, the whole wellness piece that fits into uh, sustainable buildings um, is more important for them to attract and retain employees. You know, the war for talent is um, ongoing. So um, I think from an asset owner's perspective and a builder's perspective, um, there will be a little bit of a shift, but not too material. It's been happening gradually over the years. The construction industry is known as having one of the tightest margins, which has led to the inevitable collapse of many building firms over the years. How has BuildCorp retained such a solid financial foundation for so long? This is our fourth downturn and, and there is something in the nature of a lot of building contractors where we get into these race to the bottom, you know, pricing projects at negative margins and, and you just can't do that. You know, by and large, someone's got to pay at the end of the day for the project to happen. And, you know, invariably, not always, it'll be screwing of your supply chain, which doesn't make sense at all. We've stayed solid because we don't do that. The building costs what it's going to cost. We will, uh, of course, give away margin to a client, but not screw our supply chain, you know, screw our supply chain to go back to subbies and, and you know, hold the torch to their feet in an unreasonable way because at the end of the day if you do that they're going to go over and what's going to happen to your project so you know we need our supply chain to be strong and healthy and everybody needs to be paid fairly and reasonably and sensible clients understand that and we've got a good uh, portfolio of blue chip clients who who get all of that they, they want the project built well they understand that sometimes um, you might need to pay a little bit more in a particular area, you know, uh, depending on the nature of the project. Is it something that relies heavily on IT and, and you know, your services engineers and that services um, subcontractor is worth paying a premium for to ensure that that doesn't miss, but, you know, we might want to perhaps make some savings elsewhere um, in, in other trades. So we focus on keeping a robust business uh, model here and the reason for that is so we can keep all of our people employed because it takes a long time to build a good quality team and um, we don't want any downturn to um, have us lose any of them. How different is operating a construction business today as compared with say 20 years ago in particular with regard to systems and processes and safety and HR and that sort of thing? All of those have increased um, exponentially and I, I think that's good in a number of respects. It has added a lot of what we call red tape, um, so the cost of running businesses uh, matters. But if we take safety and quality, for example, those two are ones that you would never step back from um, investing in. And I say HR as well with respect to ensuring the entry point of 
new employees into the business is, is solid. We're employing people who have aligned values and aligned culture. We're not just quickly grabbing the next person we can find, that we're considering what do we stand for here at Build Corp and what type of employee would uh, fit our culture here. Um, with respect to safety, you would never drop that one and let that go, but safety comes at a cost. We have a bit, very big safety team here at Build Corp. And for us, that investment in safety comes at a cost and and that will be reflected through project costs, but we would never step back from that. You know, Tony, my husband, has made a commitment that every single Bill Corp employee will go home safe every day and everyone on it and our Bill Corp sites will and we do everything we can to ensure that. So there are some things that um, you could make a decision to say it's a bit too expensive to invest in those resources, quality resources, that, but no, it's not who we are and we may not always be the lowest price, but uh, we do ensure that uh, we've built into every uh, project team the opportunities to make sure the project is built safely, um, that the client ends up with an asset that they're really proud to own and that, that we're not back every you know week remediating defects. You mentioned culture there, just looking around the office this morning, you can tell staff are engaged and, and happy. How do you build such a strong culture? It takes time, doesn't it? You've got to be really clear on your values and what you stand for personally as leaders in a business. And um, I think everyone here at Build Club is very clear on that with Tony and I, and perhaps that's easy when you're a family business and you're not a you know big multinational behemoth. You can you get a good line of sight straight through to the top and go, okay, I get it. That's who they are. That's what they stand for, and that's how things are done around here. Not everyone needs to agree with the values that you ascribe to, and of course we have our own uh, corporate code of conduct, our own corporate values. But if they're not aligned with them here at Build Corp to work here, you, you would probably find yourself not comfortable. Uh, working here and and will more likely be more comfortable somewhere else and every different organisation has got its own culture and its own values and it's a matter of finding where as I saying your vibe attracts your tribe right this is how Tony and I walk and this is what we do and I think it's really important that anybody who comes along to Build Corp and has a look at our corporate values and says they look a little bit similar to mine they're probably going to work out well here and we can teach and train technical skills but we can't teach somebody not to be lazy, not to be dishonest, not to be their character traits. We, we can't change that. So we employ on values and fit and we teach technical skills. You launched Bill Corp over 30 years ago with your husband, Tony, who you mentioned there. Can you tell me about how you started the business and what the opportunity that you saw at the time was? We'd always hoped one day to have a construction company, um, but not the time it happened or how it happened. Um, but we, I guess, had, had psychologically prepared ourselves for that happening eventually. Tony was working on a for a company called Govan Corporation on a very large uh, twin tower in Chatswood, and at the time it was oh, an eighty odd million dollar project in 1989, 1990. In today's dollars, I don't know what that would be. What a couple of hundred million. Halfway through the delivery of that project, I was seven and a half months pregnant with our first child and stopped working and um, Gervan went into receivership and Tony came home without a job. Of course the timing of that wasn't what we planned. We had a conversation and made a decision to approach the client and uh, sit down and talk about starting a company and Tony continuing that project as project manager and owner of the business Build Corp and we launched Build Corp there. The client backed Tony into that and we completed the project, um, well Tony completed the project, I was at home for six years, had another child after that. Tony completed the project but Bill Corp launched then in the middle of a downturn, it was a serious downturn, that was the 18.5% interest downturn. I was 26, he was 30 and it's not the size project we envisaged we'd be doing for our first job. It was about $47 million worth of work from memory um, in those days left to do so it certainly wasn't how we imagined the start. And then quite sensibly, the second project was a $30,000 preschool fence. <laughs> um, and that was where Bill's Corp began from. So it was a bit of a, um, an unusual start, but I think it was good for us because we're people who see opportunity more than challenges and problems. And we are optimistic, um, but we're not reckless. And I think, you know, when your husband comes home without a job in a downturn and it was a it was a property downturn so the opportunities for for jobs weren't you know everywhere it's a very vulnerable place for a family to be and i think that informs the way you lead and informs the decisions you make and the risks that you allow the business to um, 
you know, hold on to. So you asked earlier, how do we keep the business stable or financially stable? You keep a strong balance sheet because I have been that woman where her husband came home from a construction job without a job at a very vulnerable time. So you lead with empathy. You make decisions um, informed by your own experiences and We'd both come out of construction, so we both uh, knew the sector and how hard it is. We understood the nature of the tight margins in there, but it, it's not a sector for everybody. You, you've got to love that chase and kill. You've got to love the the energy on construction sites. I'd, I'd worked on construction sites with civil and civic, and it's actually a lot of fun. I'm actually a medical research scientist by training. I, I worked on a construction site for a couple of months, and that was... I don't know, 38 years ago or something, 1985, how long ago was that? It's not for everybody. Um, most people wouldn't get out of bed for the margins that we operate on, but um, you need to be passionate about what you do, and we certainly are. And if you look at the business today, 350-odd employees delivered over $6 billion in projects, $650-plus million in revenue per annum. How have you gone about that process of expansion over the past 30 years? Slow, controlled growth never taken our hands off. It would have been really easy to turn this thing into a billion dollar business years ago. But why? You know, why? To say, run a billion dollar business? Well, here, we're bottom line focused. You know, trying to ensure that we keep our people employed. And people say that as though that's words. But, well, let's say you don't care about your people and we've got such long tenure here. We, the, our people here are like our family. Let's assume that you don't care about your people and just commercially, that's your only driver. Well, to find talent, <laughs> you know, if you, in a downturn, lose them and have to go back and find talent again, you're going to go through two or three people before you find the right person. You're going to be paying recruitment firms to, you know, a premium to try and find the right people. It comes at a commercial cost to lose talent and it should come at a personal and emotional cost to lose talent, good people. So. If you put your people at the heart of what you do and your only driver is a commercial return, you'll get it. But if you put your people at the heart of what you do and your driver is to create a good, honest business that people are proud to come to work to every day and you're proud to align yourself with, that's a lot more satisfying anyway. But ideally, you want both, right? Reflecting on the past 30 years, what have been the greatest challenges that you've faced? Well, this is our fourth economic downturn. <sighs> But we, we're pretty good with our headspace. We, as soon as downturns come, Tony and I are pretty quick to look for opportunities and remain positive through any changes that need to be made in the organisation. But pretty much business is business. If you do the right thing, you work really hard, you'd be pretty unlucky to go under. And I'd say a lot of um, uh, hospitality probably felt that in through COVID this time because you know, some of those formulas weren't going to work for hospitality businesses, but it's to do with your risk appetite. Um, what are you going to lose if you, you know, if, if the worst came, if worst came to the worst and we found ourselves on JobKeeper, what would have been the consequences for us as a business? I, I have thought about that, interestingly. Um, we're not so highly geared, we would have gone under. Uh, we're not so highly geared, we would have lost the house. So, you know, it's this balance of gearing and, and risk appetite, understanding that there are going to be ups and downs. What's the main game here? You want to keep the business and keep our people, ensuring that it, as much as is, is reasonable, um, you keep that balance of, of um, well, I guess, your gearing um, under control. So you are in control. Your hands are firmly on the levers of your business, not relying on the economy to be there with work, that you're in control and driving the ship. What are the major themes that you've noticed in the construction sector? We talked about sustainability, but what are some of the other themes that you've seen recently? Well, we ended up with a, a very strong union movement because construction sites, um, and, and still can be the case, have been places where, you know, they're dangerous. And I can remember some of the practices on sites, and we saw ourselves at Civil and Civic as, you know, outstanding with respect to safety in the day. Of course, we all improve over the years and get and get better and better. So safety has been a huge change over the years. But you know, we ended up with a very strong union movement because it is a dangerous place, and there will always be um, unscrupulous operators everywhere. And we want to make sure that we protect everybody on our side. So safety was a big change. Some of the technology that's coming into construction services, BIM, has been a really big thing for us. But certainly. The, the way that we build things. Uh, so BIM with respect to clash detection has probably been really important for us around services. We build the same, we build the same, we build the same really. If I look at this building here that we're sitting in now, it's an old Grace Brothers repository. 
We've had the building nearly 30 years. That's where our head office is here in Sydney. And it's bricks and timber. And we've been delivering these CLT, you know, these beautiful timber buildings as though it's something new. But if you look around this whole building, there are timber beams and timber columns and timber. So, you know, as, as though it's something new and we'd offer this service when this whole building is, you know, nearly 100 years old. So we value the heritage of old, of old buildings and I think, that, you know, we want to make sure that we enhance and, and protect and save what we've got because while we're only a couple of hundred years old as a nation now, we, do, we are beginning to respect some of the heritage that we do have and deliver them, but not a lot that I can see has, has changed materially like other sectors have. Though it's changing, you're one of only a few females in leadership positions within the construction and property sectors. Has this been difficult and what are your proudest achievements? It hasn't been difficult and I don't know why. Um, I would assume it's because my husband and I have always worked together and um, anything, you know, when shared, a problem shared, it was always have been terrific. I'm really proud of the people who've come through, some of the ways that they've built, some of the ways that they've led, probably not so much about the material things, but how our people have operated and there's an integrity within the business that I'm really proud to be associated with and proud of the people that work here. Yeah, it's probably not anything necessarily we've built, but how we've gone about it. I'm proud of the, of the team. Are you starting to see more female participation on work sites? 100%. Yeah, it's it's not ha happening as quickly as some of us would like. But that said, there are lots of sectors where there is a an issue around gender diversity. I often call up nursing as one similar to us here in construction, where they've got the same issue in reverse. And would we argue that nursing would be you know would benefit from more men um, participating? Well, yeah, because then it's half the patients are men. And I'd say the same in construction. If you look at buildings, well, half the people that live in buildings are women. So, of course, we benefit from that different lens. So I think diversity in all of its forms everywhere is a great thing. But the reality is I have a son and a daughter, and my son is interested in construction and my daughter wasn't, and I'm not entirely sure what to do about that when she had me as a role model um, in construction. So there are some things, some things and some sectors that are just automatically, and I'm speaking you know, broadly here, that are going to attract more women and some things are going to attract more men and that's okay. But where there are huge differentials, uh, like we see in some sectors, I think we probably do need to correct that a bit, especially when, if we look at primary school teachers and childcare workers, half of those kids are, are boys, but we have very few men and that pipeline is diminishing for male teachers. And I think that's an issue in um, leadership roles in accounting firms and legal firms and some medical professions. Um, there's a narrowed pipeline for women the higher up they get where the entry point into those professions is the same. So if you look at graduates coming into uh, the big four accounting firms here in Australia, the legal firms, same number of men and women and in fact often there's more women. Um, but something goes wrong at the top whereas here in construction our pipeline is about 9% of women that graduate from these uh, careers but here at Build Corp in our cadet training program we have 50% entry of men and women but gee we've got to work hard to find the women. Let's shift gears you were appointed chair of Sport Australia in February after a long involvement across sports including as president of Australia's women's rugby. Tell me where do you see the future of Australian sports going to? What are, what are the, the major impediments or, or hurdles to get over? Sport seems to be such a huge part of the Australian psyche and we see ourselves as people who participate in sport with a bit of larrikinism and sometimes a bit of sledging we seem to let slip through and that's okay but we see ourselves as fair and honest participants and I've only been having a conversation the last couple of days around how the nation responded when we had in cricket the ball tampering episode and particularly with that sport and the involvement of that captain. So we had the captain of the Australian cricket team involved in a ball tampering incident and how the nation turned on this young man, how we as Australians, so we got a, what was he, 26 or something, a very young man, leading his country in what John Howard described as the second most important job in the country. We would have forgiven him for a bit of, you know, sledging and a bit of that, but not behaving with integrity, we went, cr it just, the country went silly. We almost drove a young man to his grave. I, I actually watched that terrified for the mental health of that young man, but how we responded as a country, I think said a lot about how we see ourselves and ourselves um, in sport. We see ourselves as, you know, 
what, what we were happy to let slip through with sledging, the minute it came to a question about integrity and how we participate in sport, we see ourselves as honest. That, I think, needs to um, remain at the heart of how we build sport in this country and how we invest in it, both as a government and, and as businesses. So in Build Corp, we invest in rugby union because that's something we do and we engage in sponsorships and enjoy that. But there is significant government funding that comes and gets amplified at exciting things like World Cups and Olympic Games and et cetera. But I think though it's such an important part of the fabric of who we are and how we see ourselves, especially the way I saw the way we responded to uh, the Steve Smith um, and the ball tampering matter. I think we almost need to help Australians and government reimagine what we'd be like without sport. You know, and why investment in sport is important, not just for the way we've historically sold sport, which is if you participate in sport, you'll be healthier, um, you meet people, you'll be happier. I actually see it as so much broader than that. There's a, there's a broader halo effect as the, these are the secondary benefits of participation in sport. And when I talk participation, I talk in all of its guises, you know, uh, coaches, managers, volunteering. That I mean, I would argue that I'm a volunteer and a servant of sport. I've never played rugby. Um, and I've not participated in team sport, but look at the role I hold. Mm. And I'd argue I'm a product of being around healthy, high-performing sports environments. So, I think it was about six or seven years ago in England when they reinvented their whole sports funding arrangement and it obviously led to much more superior performances. Is there enough investment in things like facilities, training programs, participation, awareness at the moment? It's beginning now to get the focus it deserves and some of that was driven by the, particip the increased participation of women in sport when all of a sudden they turned up to grounds, there weren't enough grounds, there weren't facilities, change room facilities and toilets for women. So some of that's being driven by some of the social changes we've seen in participation which is, is around women and that's important. Some of the things that we've got on our um, agenda at the moment at the Sports Commission are around historical cultural issues and what we want to make sure is that parents, when they're looking for what their children might do in their uh, spare time, that they keep sport front and centre of everything that they do. Now, I've got two children. One was always passionate about sport, one was passionate about music. But I ensured that both of them always remained in sport right until they finished school and then when they were adults, they made their own decisions and they're still engaged in, in um, fitness and sport in their own ways. I think we need to talk about other benefits of, of being engage in sport and understanding who the influences are to participation in sport. And if it's children participation, 100% it's a parents. And what benefit would an aspirational parent see in sports participation for their child? And I would argue that 99.95% of the time, most parents will go only upside. They met friends, they learned skills, they became healthier, they were outside, you know, running around, not sitting inside, in front of a computer, etc. So. I'm conscious of time, so a couple of quick fire questions to finish. You've been on the board of Opera Australia for over 10 years now. How are the creative arts or art sectors responding to the challenges of last year? We've been smashed. It's been so hard. And our, and our poor people, they're used to um, performing together as teams and it's, it's been incredibly difficult. But we are the only opera company to have continued. We started performing so much earlier. I think La Scala came back this week from memory. I think it was La Scala, which is the first one. Um, after us, we've been running operas now for a number of months now and the only opera company in the world, so I'm very proud of that. You've also been chair of Bill Court Foundation for quite some time as well. You launched it with your, uh, your husband, Tony. Um, wh why is philanthropy and giving back to the community so important to you both? I think we were born into families that instilled that in us. It's just what you do, I think, and we enjoy it and I would argue we get much more out of it than we ever put in. To finish, what can we expect in the growth of Bill Corp uh, as a business over the next five to ten years? As boring as it sounds, more of the same. An industry as volatile as ours, slow, steady, controlled growth. Josephine Sukar, pleasure having you on this morning. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here.